Let's see, my, my folks purchased this property probably about 15 years ago. Uh, when they first bought it, it was just a cedar thicket. We're driving through as kids looking, scratching our chins, going, boy, y'all spent 10 years looking for a piece of property and this is what you came up with. But my mom's kind of a visionary and she knew, she rode around it on a horseback so she could see above all the shrub junipers and she could see the views that were accessible up here. Didn't want to be down in the lowlands because we dealt with floods and things like that before. Um, so they bulldozed a lot of the cedar, opened up some of the grassland started coming back, but when I started looking at it as I was in um, my ecology degree at Trinity University, just started looking at the grassland and it was all scrubby, rocks, you know, they'd always joke that that uh, rocks just grew out here. And in my like child mind, I was like, rocks don't grow. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Something else is going on. <laughs> and so started looking into erosion control and how can we make rocks not grow because as a punishment as a kid anytime I'd get in trouble I would carry wheelbarrows of rocks so I was like I'll show you rocks I'll make sure that you don't grow in my pasture anymore <laughs> so you know kind of a personal vendetta against the rocks a little bit I just started looking into every third world agriculture method that exists my job is a remote medic working for remote medical international uh, takes me around the world to teach various different populations who don't have much, but they're trying to do the most with what they got. And so a lot of it's repurposing materials, taking things out of the garbage and making splints out of them. And so when it came to just, you know, repurposing the use of an eggshell as a fertilizer or this or that and combining things that people were just throwing away, there was a lot of availability of, of resource when the garbage got pulled apart. Um, so over here we have our biofertilizer station which was a, a method I learned from Moss Humus which is a great organization. Uh, learned about it from a man named Eugenio Grass and uh, it's basically we, we go to the slaughterhouse, collect the rumen from the end of the day slaughter. So cow guts and the offal is just sitting in a barrel. Get two people, hopefully three people if you got them and you just pull up the big offal, you pop a hole in it, hold your breath, <laughs> squeeze all the contents of What's an offal? Offal is all of the guts. So when you when you hang a, a steer, you drop all the guts out of it. Okay. We they just call it Okay. offal. Um, and inside of that there's a giant container like this big called the rumen. That's the first chamber of the gut, which the beauty of the the rumen is it has a massive colony of lactobacillus bacteria. Lactobacillus is a beneficial anaerobe. Mm -hmm. Anaerobes as anaerobes are less known. So anaerobes are like in our deep soils and they're the real miners. They're mining the bedrock layers, they're secreting all kinds of weird stuff, they stink, they got the sulfurs and methanes and stuff like that. So when your compost pile smells funky, you probably got some anaerobes hanging out in there. But we take the lactobacillus, put it in these containers, add uh, rock minerals, all the different rock minerals that we were deficient on. Long story short, when we get these big 11 year solar cycles, Earth gets hit by a big old blast of solar energy. When it hits the Earth, it rips apart south and north poles. So now we have functionally a monopole. Uh, a lot of people Still, this will probably even like rustle, ruffle some feathers because we were just going for anything that was 180 degrees opposite from the status quo. And this definitely met the criteria. Uh, so certain rocks hold more of this type of magnetism. So when you put out paramagnetic rock onto gardens, it basically works at a physics level to increase the amperage between the, the soil and the plant. So at a very subtle level, you get plants that just grow better. You get foods that are more nutritious and all kinds of good stuff happen. So we took that paramagnetic rock, put it into our biofertilizer. You finally t top it off with some wood ashes for, for uh, potassiums and throw some yeast in there, molasses and whey from milk. So what that does, you cap it off. And we'll, I'll show it to you in just a second. Um, the yeast consumes all the oxygen it turns it into an anaerobic environment. So then the lactobacillus wakes up and it starts munching all those rock minerals. So then at the end of two months, you can leave it for longer. Some of these have been sitting for over a year and it just gets better and better. When it's done, it's really high in B vitamins and 
uh, very bioavailable minerals. So instead of putting rock phosphate on a plant, which then the plant has to allow to soak into its roots, it has to allow its own anaerobes to break that rock down, and then it pulls it up through its phloem and xylem and works really hard to get those nutrients. Once you've pre-eaten it from the, the anaerobes, you bas basically got a mama bird over here just munching all your rock minerals. And so when you then oxygenate it through these flow forms, uh, it puts it in a highly bioavailable form that when you spray it on the plant, it absorbs directly through its skin. Here's your recipe. Make your, make your own biofertilizer. This is non-proprietary. There are no patents. I will not charge you. Once these are finished, since it's an anaerobic system, there is a possibility that there could be some bad anaerobes, meaning like salmonellas, E. coli, a small chance, but we do it, we make sure everything's clean when we do it, but whenever you're working with anaerobes, that's a possibility. So we take it, we bring down one of these totes, we set it right here, we turn on a pump and it flushes it through these flow forms. I purchased these from a wonderful group of sculptors in Austria called flowforms.net and purchased them in bulk because they were cheaper, so I have like 40 more of them. If anyone gets just so excited about them, where, where, they, um, where they came from was they started mimicking structures of the human anatomy and seeing what they did to fluids. So this is modeled after the sinus of Alsalva, which is the massive chamber where blood leaves the heart. And so they modeled that chamber and what occurs whenever this is pumping is you basically have a chaos chamber, big white water area, and then water comes down here, it gets rerouted, it makes a figure eight right here, it turns into this nice laminar flow, and then it creates a vortex. And then the vortex is constantly pulsing back Vortexing and forth. Vortexing laminar flow. Exactly. So you have, wow. you're, it's basically in this tiny little basin, it tries to replicate how a stream works. You have white water crashing, you then have that nice little riffles and laminar flow moving across the gravel beds, and then you have water hits a rock, and behind the rock you get an eddy current or a vortex around ponds, make whole yeah. big living water gardens out of them. Just depends on what you're into. Okay. This was the cheapest and smallest one that they provide, so that's why I got it. And it's the best at oxygenating things. Sure, yeah. So. Which is why you did for the anaerobes. Exactly. It reminds me of just pouring your wa your bottle of wine through like an aerator Same or something. Same concept. Just to get the bubbles. You're, you're taking yep. something and you're changing the quality of it through its... Uh, Oxygenation. Exactly. And, and just increasing the surface area that's in contact with oxygen. Okay, so you put the ruminants in... So in the, the, the rumen, stomach. the contents of the gut, yeah. not the actual stomach lining itself. We yep. just empty the guts that's just slightly fermented grass. So is that, is that grass... And the, forbs. Has and that forbs. not been digested? Not no. fully. Okay. Because it's okay. in the first chamber of the gut. And how many chambers... And you're doing this with, with cows? With cows. So you just focus on the rumen contents because okay. the bacteria change as it moves through their system. And how many chambers do they have? Four, right? What do they have? Four? To tell you the truth, I've been so wrapped up in the magic of the rumen that I don't, sure. I'm not a specialist on like how the entire rest of a but cow the, but works. It, but it's still Maybe within it. that first chamber. Yeah, the first chamber. Okay, okay, gotcha. And when I went in to harvest it, I'd never seen cow guts before. And the, the slaughter, the butcher said, oh, don't worry, you'll know which one's the rumen. And he left and I was like, oh gosh, I hope I know what he's talking about. And there's one chamber that's this big, uh, yeah. you know? And then there's a bunch of other like squiggly lines and intestines and stuff. And you're like, well, must be that big beach ball <laughs> okay. looking fella. And you just go and you pop it open, drain it into a 55 gallon drum. Okay. We got about, f each cow produces 25 to 50 liters of rumen contents. Okay, how rank is this? Super rank. Yeah. Okay. It's just really sticky. I okay. mean, luckily. You gotta strain it before you put it through this thing. Yeah. yeah. And then how many times have you done this? Since 2012, <laughs> we've probably done the collection process. We've probably done maybe four times. The beauty of this system is once you get it going, it's a live culture, just like you can keep a sourdough starter alive like a for years. Exactly. It's uh, just scoby. another. It's just another life form that you're just feeding. And so after you take the, the liquid contents out, 
run it through here. You just add more molasses, yeast, milk, fill it back up with water, feed the beast, put the cat back on, and then it just continues to reproduce. This thing gets up here. And this just re pretty much remains. So how we put out all this biofertilizer is with this little guy. These mules are all over the place. You just put up the front seat. You can stick those uh, totes in the back. You put a little bar on the back with a small little pump and it just pumps it out. It kicks it out in, you know, probably a 25 foot spray radius. And then you just drive around in circles all night long with hopefully some friend who's come and kept you company while you're driving around spraying it on everything. And that's where all this grass is coming from. Sir. Berms, we did put seed balls out. And in those seed balls... You did seed balls? We did a thousand pounds of seed balls. Did you hand you make them yourself? Uh, yep. Me did, and a handful of friends. How did it work? That's what I want to do for... Oh, man. I want to do that with my kids. Worked great. Okay. They're amazing. Can you do trees that way? Or did y'all just did cover crop? Like? We just did cover crop. So, okay. so in all these berms, these berms were just pure white caliche. And I was really skeptical. I mean, I'm a general optimist by nature, but I was pretty skeptical that anything would grow on that caliche. Because it just looked like road base. It looked like, like we'd, these berms just looked like we'd built flat on contour roads all over the place. So for our seed balls, we took clay, biochar, um, endomycorrhizal and ectomycorrhizal fungus to work inside the seed and outside the seed. Bokashi, which is just another stabilized probiotic, another form of lactobacillus, I believe. Um, compost, good dairy compost with high microbial content, and then every seed that we could get our hands on. A lot of Illinois bundle flower is what we planted because it's, uh, it's a perennial nitrogen fixing shrub that produces a, a seed very high in protein. So it produces like a little flax seed, which is really good for the birds. We got little trees growing, taller grasses that help with the wind erosion, the berms help with the water erosion, the whole system's kind of moving back towards healthy again.